It is time for questions to the Minister of Justice. We will start with listed questions, and I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Mr. McCartney. Yes, the Question one, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, Northern Ireland has three full-time coroners, one of whom, John Leckie, is due to retire on the 31st of October. A competition to appoint a successor to Mr. Leckie was launched on the 10th of September. The Lord Chief Justice has assigned a county court judge to the coroner's service to provide additional capacity, and a high court judge has been assigned to deal with the new inquest which is to be held into the death of Pierce Jordan. I have also asked the Lord Chief Justice to exercise his statutory powers under Section 6.2 of the Coroner's Act, Northern Ireland, 1959, to appoint temporary additional cover sorry, temporary additional coroners to cover vacancies caused by the absence of a coroner due to illness. In addition, the Courts and Tribunal Service has appointed a senior business manager to support the coroners. Arrangements are also being progressed to recruit two investigating officers for the coroners service and to strengthen the panel of counsel available to support the coroners in the discharge of their functions. However, as I've said before, progress in dealing with the past, including the legacy inquest pro process, can only be made in the context of the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement and the associated funding for which it provides. Mr. McCartney, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for his answer. The Minister has outlined that there are a number of recruiting processes in place, but I, I just would seek the reassurance of the Minister uh, as he's satisfied that there will be no gaps in the system as we go forward uh, as a result of these recruiting processes. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I'm not sure I can give an assurance of no gaps going forward, but certainly the process in particular of the Section 6.2 uh, process to appoint temporary coroners is a relatively straightforward one, uh, which is already underway, and my understanding is that there's a potential for people to be imposed within a very short period of time. Obviously, the, uh, the job of the Judicial Appointments Commission uh, in making the permanent appointment will take uh, slightly longer. But the fact we now have a county court judge and a high court judge already assigned is, I believe, strengthening the coroner's service quite considerably. Mr. Jim Allister. Since the re uh, retirement of the chief coroner was well known in advance, been flagged up for some time, why was it not till September that, an advertise, uh, that, that the recruitment process began? Why were there several months lost? in that process? Well, I'm afraid uh, I have no answer to give Mr. Alistair since I'm not responsible for the appointment of coroners and I'm therefore not sure why the particular timescale is happening. But what I do know is the process is underway and I trust that the post will be filled permanently as soon as possible. Inform the House that question number two has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. The extent to which unspent criminal convictions should be taken into account when considering a claim for criminal injuries compensation is being addressed as part of the overall review of the compensation scheme. A public consultation exercise was undertaken earlier this year and responses are being considered with the intention of bringing forward a post-consultation report and proposals for a new scheme by the end of the year. I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Um, can I just ask him what specific criteria will, he will use um, to withhold or reduce a compensation reward based on a, an applicant's character? Well, I'm afraid, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a bit difficult to say what I will do when the consultation responses are being analysed and proposals are being developed. But it is clear that even some of the proposals that were made uh, for reducing the effect of unspent convictions did not attract universal support in that consultation process and it will be necessary to look in detail as to how that's to be handled but certainly I would expect when we produce uh, the firm proposals for the new scheme uh, there's likely to be a lot of interest in this chamber and no doubt some members may consider tabling for a debate at that point if they believe there are issues that need to be teased out. There is a difficult balance to be struck in particular about historic convictions and that is one which is not easily resolved in the current political difficulties. Ms. Bronman McCaughan. Gurmi, I've got question four. The PSNI's Rural Crime Unit was a central resource for identifying trends and patterns in rural crime. 
Information from the unit was used by police commanders to enhance the effectiveness of their operational tactics in preventing and detecting rural and agricultural crime. The work of the unit was supported by a dedicated data analyst who was part funded by my department. Information provided by the analyst informed the work of the Rural Crime Partnership, a collaborative arrangement between my department, the PSNI, NFU Mutual and the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. I understand that as part of the PSNI's termination of contracts for associate workers, the contract for this post was not renewed beyond the 31st of December 2014. While there is no longer a dedicated rural crime data analyst, I understand the PSNI statistics branch continues to produce detailed quarterly updates on agricultural and rural crime in Northern Ireland. This allows key stakeholders to continue to monitor trends in crime committed in rural settlements and agricultural crime and to allocate resources accordingly. For supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, given the prevalence of off rural crime and just after a week which has seen another 13 cattle stole in an area between Ahnacloy and Kelleton having a devastating impact yet again on another farming family, can I ask the Minister, as it appears that the contract for the data analysis post within the rural crime unit has not been renewed, that if the Minister would give serious consideration to renew in this very important role. Gura Mayogut. Well, I accept that there was an important role performed by the data analyst. I think the reality is that that work has been embedded within the PSNI statistics unit in a way it was not previously the case. Certainly, when, when I became uh, minister a mere five and a half years ago, uh, the definition of urban and rural in PSNI terms appeared to uh, depend upon whether it was one within the Belfast sub-region or beyond it. With the result, there were large rural areas in areas like Antrim and Lisburn and Ards, which were classified as urban, and major urban settlements in the rest of it, all, all but the city of Derry, were classified as rural. So we have got a lot better analysis now. That is being embedded through the, the individual districts. And the reality was, given the budget cuts that were being made, and frankly, given also the political will from some people to see the ending of those particular contracts, uh, it was not possible to retain that post. And I don't see how in current financial difficulties it would be possible to reinstate it. The important issue is to see that the work is being done otherwise. Mr. Neil Somerville. I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, Nuri, Armad and Dungannon, Dard, veterinary offices all cons consistently report the highest number of stolen or missing cattle. The proximity of the border is each and not a coincidence. Would the Minister support a national crime agency investigation to these organised crime gangs? Well, the Minister always supports the operational decisions of the NCA which best address its responsibilities because he doesn't direct the NCA any more than he directs the PSNI what to do. Uh, but there is a perfectly valid point which has just been made, that there is no doubt that the prevalence of cattle thefts are greatest in border areas of Northern Ireland and are also greatest in border areas of the Republic. And there's clearly an issue to be addressed there. Uh, certainly, I believe, as part of the ongoing work to address crime on a cross-border basis, good work is being done in a number of different areas. Um, I will certainly happily uh, draw the issue of cattle rustling uh, to the attention of the police and the Garda Shikana when I am um, next speaking to them, and indeed when I'm speaking this week to the Irish Justice Minister at the Organised Crime Cross-Border Seminar. Uh, but there are real issues given the resources that are available, and there are other matters which may be done to help protect livestock in terms of some of the initiatives which are being run by PCSPs and so on to, to assist people with things like Farmwatch. So it's not simply a matter of waiting for the, the formal agencies. There's also the issue as to what can be done in partnership to fight those who would engage in this kind of crime. Mr. Joe Byrne. I ask the Minister, does he recognise that this is a serious issue for the farming community? Many farmers that have suffered rustling of cattle can't get compensation, and there is no such thing as a, an adequate uh, insurance policy for them. In his discussions with the Minister for Justice and the Republic, can he accentuate a sense of urgency because there is a fear that this has been allowed to slip? Well, I certainly agree with Mr. Byrne that this is an issue of significant concern to those families which suffer, as indeed also um, 
thefts of machinery and plant in particular tractors you know, can cause particular difficulties. And I know in my own constituency there was a slight upswing a year or so ago in that kind of theft. Uh, I've been assured that uh, the treatment of rural crime such as this is a priority in those border areas of Armagh and Tyrone, which have been highlighted earlier on. But there's also an issue of individual citizens doing what they can to protect their, you know, their stock and of people being the eyes and ears of the community and contacting police if they have concerns and also joining uh, activities like Farm Watch you know, to help keep tabs on what is happening. This is not simply something where we can depend upon the two police services. It requires a joined up community effort. Ms. Megan Farron. Carmel, get cash to record question five, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, the appointment of most of the key personnel in the justice system is out, out with my department. However, many leading roles within the criminal justice system are held by women. Female representation on public bodies within the criminal justice system was sitting at 39 per cent at the 31st of March. Both the chair and the director of the probation board are women. The chair of the policing board is also held by a woman, one of the six women I appointed to the board earlier this year, alongside only three men. Within my own top team, two of the five roles, including the Director General of the Prison Service, are held by women. Fair for a supplementary. Margaret Laskin, I thank the Minister for his um, answer so far. Perhaps many of the roles are held by women, but um, might, maybe not enough. I would just ask the Minister, is he aware of research carried out by the Judicial Appointments Commission that found that there's a culture that exists within the criminal um, legal and justice system that discriminates against women and may act as a barrier for women to achieving um, senior appointments? Yes, I can certainly assure Ms Fearon that I am aware of that research uh, which has been carried out with specific reference to the judiciary, but as far as the appointments themselves are concerned, um, I need to leave those very carefully with the Judicial Appointments Commission under the chairmanship of the Lord Chief Justice, uh, one person on whose uh, turf I do not like to tread. Ms. Karen McEver. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask uh, the Minister what work can be done to assist uh, females in achieving higher levels within the judiciary? <coughs> well, again, in answer to Ms. McEver, specifically, if she's talking about the judiciary, I need to be very careful in saying what can be done, because that is a responsibility which sits firmly uh, with the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, if she were to discuss the wider issues, of in encouraging females to take up appointments across the higher reaches of the justice system. I can only say what I've quoted. I believe those areas where I have a degree of responsibility have, have shown some positive movements uh, this year uh, in particular, but it is a matter of encouraging women to play their full part in public life across a whole range of different areas, and the justice system, frankly, is not much different from others. Uh, I have no doubt that some members will look across the border at a female Justice Minister, a female Attorney General, a female Lord Chief Justice and a female Garda Commissioner, but I am not responsible for the point of any of them or of their equivalents in Northern Ireland. Mr. Speaker, question number six. Principal Deputy Speaker, an outlined business case for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison was approved by DFP on the 9th of January 2015. I met with the then Minister of Finance and Personnel on the 28th of April to discuss capital funding for delivery of the prison services state strategy. It is difficult to make commitments to deliver an eight-year construction programme without the assurance of funding across a number of spending review periods. Securing the necessary capital will determine the timeline for the development of the new prison at McGilligan. My officials will complete the necessary bid to secure capital funding for the project when it is launched by DFP. Ms. Sugden for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, at what point does the Department need to reevaluate the outline business case, which is nearly a year into approval by DFP? Um, I'm happy to say, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, that the outline business case is a sound case that was, uh, was done a year ago. Um, and there is no likelihood of it needing to be renewed in the near future. The question is much more, at what point will the executive agree the finances for Northern Ireland for the future to know what the opportunities are for capital spending, not just on McGilligan Prison, but also on the much needed women's facility and the upgrading of accommodation at McGabry as well. Mr. John Dowler. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his uh, response, and I'm doing my best to interpret it as positive. 
given that the Minister did give this Assembly an assurance that he was committed to the uh, McGilligan Prison staying on its present site, can he tell the House what preparatory work has been done to give confidence to the 300 people that work there and indeed the families of people who prefer their uh, family members to be there rather than in that other place called McGabry? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, we shouldn't suggest that preparing the outlined business case was not a great deal of preparatory work. And that uh, business case has involved all aspects of the running of the prison, including looking at future arrangements for uh, training, job skills, health care, staffing. So it is not simply a matter of looking at buildings as being a major uh, business case to look at what the needs will be into the future. That, I believe, is a firm statement of commitment, following through on the commitment that I gave uh, to this Assembly when I reported back on that particular aspect of the prison reform programme. But the fundamental issue is not whether the DOJ is committed to the developments which are needed at McGilligan and the other prisons, but whether the capital is available, and that requires a joined-up executive decision. It's not even just a matter for justice and finance, but it will require the executive as a whole to prepare a capital programme. Ms. Sandra Overend. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Is the Minister aware um, that following the delays and prevarications over the Community Safety College in Desert Crete, uh, Desert Crete uh, that there is a great deal of suspicion uh, that McGilligan's location west of the ban uh, is not helping it when it comes to uh, seeking uh, finance on urgency from his department and from the executive? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't accept the thesis that there is prevarication around Desert Creek, which is the responsibility of the DOJ, which is part of many of an executive project led jointly by the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety, when we have one, and myself. Uh, I also think it's fairly clear that by the commitment that I made to McGilligan, in defiance of a recommendation from the prison reform team that all adult male prisoners should be housed at McGabry, is an indication that there was a genuine commitment. I do remember meeting a group of councillors from some of the councils in the northwest around that time, one of whom somewhat grumpily told me that he thought some people believed the world ended at Sandy Nows. I told him I agreed with it, but pointed out as an MLA for South Antrim, I believe it starts halfway across Tomb Bridge. So it is certainly not a case of matters being centralised in Belfast. It is a matter of using the opportunities with business, with local councils, with opportunities for constructive activity which were promised and those promises are still there, and that is part of the plan for the redevelopment of the Gilligan. Paul, Ms. Michaela Boyle. Ms. <coughs> Chair Hawk, question seven. Principal Deputy Speaker, as I stated at the last oral questions, the consultation on the rationalisation of the court estate closed on the 18th of May this year. The responses to the consultation have been analysed, and advice will be submitted to me next month. Ms. Boyle, for a supplement. Gormorgat, can I thank the Minister for his response? And Minister, can you give an undertaking that your officials will come uh, to committee before any dis final decision is taken on the court closures? Uh, Gormorgat. Well, I'm happy to give Ms Boyle, as I give many members of this House on a variety of different occasions, um, a firm promise that the Department doesn't do anything without consulting the committee. Uh, because given our structures and the fact that I, on a good day, have the support of 10 or 11 people in this House, I know we wouldn't get very far if we didn't have the support of the committee. So the committee will be taken into account fully as we look at the options coming from it. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, the committee will be able, any more than the department is, to ignore the blunt financial realities of the world we live in, the decreasing amount of business going through our courts, and the decreasing amount of money which is available to run our courts. Uh, can I ask the, the uh, Minister just, in terms of the implications of access to justice and, and for justice, uh, especially for people who may have disabilities and those especially on lower income, where additional travel costs may mean exactly that, um, if you have no income or little or limited income, having to attend a court case or a court hearing may in, in actual fact cause additional burden to you. Uh, can, the, can the Minister give us some sort of an idea as to how or what evaluation was, was made of that particular issue for people on lower incomes? 
Well, as part of the examination and the report which was put out for consultation, uh, there was examination of issues like travel time and arrangements uh, between uh, potentially closing courts and potentially remaining open courts. I'm not sure that the department has the capacity to do a full analysis of the economic impact on individuals. But I would repeat the point that I made. The most accepting Mr. McLone has a point around those who have difficulty in funding travel. There's also a very significant issue that access to justice doesn't simply mean having a courtroom close at hand if the courtroom is not fit for purpose and if it doesn't operate in an efficient way which meets people's needs. There are many advantages for vulnerable victims and witnesses if they're attending some of our more modern courthouses with facilities for segregation, uh, better arrangements for video links and whatever. And access to justice is therefore not simply a matter of physical proximity, but how the justice system treats those who need to use the courts when they are in them. And that has had to be taken into account as well. Judith Cochran. Principal Deputy Speaker, of the 40 recommendations made by the Prison Review Team, only two remain outstanding, with 33 having been signed off and three remaining under assessment by the Oversight Group. An additional two recommendations have been referred by the Oversight Group to Sijini for independent assessment. The Oversight Group accepts the delivery of recommendations three on effective community sentences and 13 on the Joint Health and Justice Strategy will fall outside the lifespan of the reform programme. However, it is important to say that good progress continues to be made on these two complex recommendations. Regarding recommendation three, work is ongoing with the Lord Chief Justice to consider alternatives to custody without the need for legislative change. On recommendation 13, significant progress has been made on developing the strategy and my department will continue to work with DHS SPS colleagues on this. Four key strategic themes have emerged on which the prison system will continue to focus to ensure that it plays its part in building a safer Northern Ireland. The four themes are leadership, purposeful activity, partnership with healthcare, and a fit for purpose prison estate. While the official structures around the reform program will come to a close in the coming months, this will not mean the end of change. The Northern Ireland Prison Service will continue to embed the reforms implemented throughout the program. Cochrane for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer and um, for the leadership that he has shown in delivering such an enormous programme of reform. Mm -hmm. Is it his assessment that the reforms are being seen to take effect across all prison establishments, or are there areas where more intensive efforts are still required in order to deliver change? Well, I thank my colleague for the, uh, for the supplementary question. Uh, She's absolutely right when she makes it clear that there is a need to embed those reforms right across the prison system, which means all three institutions and the way the system as a whole functions, along with issues, for example, like the Prisoner Escort and Custody Service, PECS. Uh, there is no doubt that the reforms have perhaps made greater progress in some places than others. We've just highlighted the issue of the capital build at McGilligan. Although some extremely good work is being done in McGilligan, there is no doubt uh, that the inadequate accommodation um, in which much of training and employment opportunities are provided does not help there. We have seen some extremely good work being done uh, amongst both young offenders and the women in Hyde Bank. Uh, we will shortly see the opening of the step-down facility on the Hyde Bank site, but outside the wall uh, for women, which is a major step forward in, uh, in promoting rehabilitation. We also, of course, now have High Bank Wood operating as a college with the full partnership of the Dep uh, Department for Employment and Learning alongside uh, the Belfast Metropolitan College. So all of those are very positive signs, but there is no doubt that that reform program has been more difficult at McGabry, which is probably the most complex prison in the United Kingdom, where there have been a number of significant problems in the recent past. But I'm glad to say that the new Director of Operations working in his capacity as Governor of McGabry at this stage, is starting to make major changes there for the good. Mr Sean Lynch. Ms Ken Collier, can the Minister give an update on the Oversight Group's engagement with stakeholders, particularly those in healthcare? Can I it? Well, I thank Mr Lynch for that question. There, there is no doubt that there have been uh, some difficulties in terms of healthcare across all of the prisons. There is no doubt that the, um, the transfer of healthcare responsibilities to the South Eastern Trust 
a few years ago was done in order to ensure that a body which had experience of health care was responsible for it. Uh, but there's also no doubt that the prison service knows more about running prisons than the South Eastern Trust does. I think what we have seen um, on slightly slower time than some other aspects of the prison reform programme is good work now being done. Uh, when the oversight group meets, uh, it is attended by the permanent secretary or another senior representative from DHS SPS and representatives from the Trust. And there is no doubt that we have seen uh, good responses from RQIA in the assessments that they are doing on the work being carried out on the healthcare side, just as we have seen some positive responses from Sijini on the prison service side. So I think it is fair to say that whilst it has not always been easy uh, to manage the healthcare aspects, there has been a lot of good work done in recent time, which I hope will see significant progress across all three prisons in the near future. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Any drugs addiction that was either uh, developed or fed whilst the prisoner was uh, in, in jail increases the likelihood of them committing a criminal act on a release and a return to prison. So can the Minister advise what progress has been made with regard to those recommendations uh, relating to reducing the misuse of drugs within the prison population? Well, Mr Beggs certainly puts his finger on an issue where there is a very significant problem in terms of running prisons. And given that it is a, you know, an issue that drugs are a problem in this society generally, it is perhaps no surprise that drugs are also a problem in prisons. Uh, last year I had the opportunity to visit one particular landing in McGabry where a group of predominantly young male prisoners uh, were seeking to overcome addiction problems and were engaging in a very intensive program uh, run partly by prison service and partly by one of our NGO partners which was showing very good results in terms of the positive options that people were taking. But it is an ongoing issue, both to ensure that as far as possible the security of prisons is managed uh, by stopping drugs coming in. And that is not always easy, given that we seek to allow uh, prisoners at times home leave and people come and go to courts and hospital appointments or whatever. And also uh, to ensure that those who want to get away from a drug problem are assisted in doing it. There is no doubt that a very large number of those who are admitted to custody have already got a pre-existing drug addiction problem, and there is significant work to be done to assist them to get away from it. Mr. Alban McGinnis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. As a strong supporter of the Minister's reform programme in relation to prisons, uh, can I congratulate the Minister on progress that has been made? But, uh, could the Minister advise the House in relation to the impact uh, that cuts in uh, the uh, budget have made in relation to the implementation of the reform programme? Well, can I thank Mr McGuinness not only for his question but for what he indicates is his ongoing support for the reform programme, which is not always common amongst barristers in this chamber. Um, he, he refers to you know, cuts having an effect on the program. There's no doubt that overall the reform program has succeeded extremely well despite the problems. But the day-to-day -day running of prisons has been affected by the reductions in budgets, where we have seen significant reductions. And unfortunately, at times, particularly when there are problems uh, with excessive numbers of prison staff sick, there have been a recent increase in the number of lockdowns early. And there's no doubt that that does not benefit rehabilitation. So we do need to continue to address those bits of work at the same time as we set the, the wider overarching uh, proposals. Uh, but by and large, I think when one compares the work of the prison reform programme with that which happened with the formation of the PSNI and looks at the amount of resources which were given to prisons compared to that which was given to the police service, there has been very considerable success although undoubtedly, particularly on the point of capital, which I mentioned earlier, uh, progress has not been quite as rapid as we would have hoped. For Mr. Oliver McMullen. Never any question nine. Principal Deputy Speaker, parole commissioner hearings are intended to be inquisitorial and the nature of these hearings as informal as possible. The Department of Justice submits a dossier to the panel covering all aspects of the prisoner's time in custody, including reports on the index offence, details of programmes undertaken while in prison, psychological reports, and an assessment of the risk of reoffending following release. The parole commissioners are responsible for coming to a view on the potential for release once they have taken account of all the information presented. 
The prisoner may apply for legal aid so he or she can appoint legal representation for support at the hearing. The Department had previously sought to mirror this representation, and a custom and practice emerged which saw a solicitor and perhaps counsel supporting the Department. However, following consultation with the parole commissioners, the Department came to the view that this practice was unnecessary in the majority of cases and was risking changing the tenor of hearings to one which was adversarial in nature. This over-reliance on legal support was simply not financially sustainable. In the majority of cases, the Department now relies on the written evidence that it makes available to the Commissioners in the form of a dossier. However, in circumstances where either the panel or departmental officials feel the need to have additional support, legal representation will still be employed. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I would like to ask the Minister if he can advise what, if any, extra measures are being taken to combat the existing and increasing burglaries in North Down and East Belfast? Well, I'm sorry, Principal Deputy Speaker, but that is an operational issue for the PSNI, and I can't, as Minister, give account for operational responses by the Chief Constable. Mr. Cree, for a supplementary. Thank you, President Deputy Speaker. It's a pity if that's the case. I thought, even out of general interest, the Minister would be talking to his colleagues. But um, reading the Belfast Telegraph today will give an example. But I'll just ask the Minister, probably know what the answer is going to be. If he's satisfied that enough has been done to apply sentences which actually deter offenders engaged in these crimes, uh, which have such a traumatic effect on the victims. Well, I'm sorry, Principal Deputy Speaker, but having said I can't answer for the Chief Constable, nor can I answer for members of the judiciary on individual sentencing policy, the House will know that I uh, may have a role in general guidelines, and we have a, um, examples where that matter has been looked at in work being done by the Lord Chief Justice, and obviously I keep potential penalties under review across a range of offences, <coughs> including those which are the responsibility of other ministers where my department has responsibility for looking to see that offences and penalties are consistent across a range of issues. But I cannot possibly comment on individual cases. Call Ms Megan Farrell. Can I ask the Minister to give an update on the Desert Creek Police and Injustice Project for Cookstown? Well, the, the answer to the, to the current issue uh, is that the matter remains under consideration. Uh, there has been a report uh, to the two ministers, um, which was only a preliminary report looking at the, the revision of the business case, uh, which is due to be made available from the programme board by the end of November. At that point, uh, the, t the two ministers will have to consider the options in conjunction with the three services, look at, you know, look at where that is, and report to the executive to look to the way forward, since the Community Safety College is an executive commitment. But at this stage, the timetable for the next significant progress is towards the end of November. Well, Ms. Farrell, for a supplementary. Mr. Margaret, um, thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask, is it the Minister's preferred option that the project stays in Cookstown as it's consistent with the Programme for Government Commitment? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the Programme for Government Commitment is to integrated training, and that is my commitment. But it is also the case that since the original proposals for an integrated community safety college, the training requirements of all three services have been reduced significantly, uh, in fact, by a factor of 48 per cent. That clearly calls into question some of the original proposals. Uh, there are also um, issues where, in particular for policing, uh, the modern trend, not just uh, in the UK but on a wider field, is that people may well enter the police service already having a number of basic qualifications, so there's significantly less to be train training to be done after people join. And the issue is to see what the best way is of providing appropriate training for the three services, acknowledging the needs have changed for each of them. And I also need to be careful that I don't suggest um, that until after next May, the Minister of Justice can speak too specifically for the Fire and Rescue Service. Before the House, the question number three has been withdrawn. I call Ms Maeve McLaughlin. Kurler, can I ask, has the Minister been briefed on the pending CGA report on McGavery? No, no, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not been briefed on that, though I have been given a general indication 
of the indication that was given to officers of the prison service. Call Ms. McLaughlin for a supplementary. Good morning, uh, and I thank the minister for that uh, answer. Um, albeit, could I maybe ask the minister to allude? Does he now share the increasing growing concerns that McGabry is not fit for purpose? Well, no, I don't accept that McGabry is not fit for purpose. I do accept that it appears likely that the criminal justice inspection report, you know, a snapshot report from an unannounced inspection some time ago, is likely to show that there were significant concerns at the time. And many members will be aware of very significant uh, work which has been done even since that inspection uh, to enhance the service which is provided at McGabry. In particular, the fact that the new Director of Operations is acting as Governor of McGabry and most of the senior team has been refreshed in order to strengthen that team and to deal with the, the difficult issues which, sound Maga which surround McGabry as the most complex prison anywhere in the United Kingdom. The fact that uh, Phil Ragg, currently acting as Governor, has previously governed Belmarsh one of the other most complex prisons in the UK, though not as complex as McGabry, is, I think, an indication of the understanding he has of dealing with those issues. And I think there is good work already being done, including, for example, addressing something I alluded to earlier, a matter of sickness rates amongst prison officers. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give this House his assessment of the impact which measures to combat rural crime are having within rural areas across Northern Ireland? Well, I think Mrs. Dobson missed, you know, missed the comments that I made earlier on on the issue of rural crime, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, but there is no doubt uh, that there have been significant hotspots of rural crime in some areas, in particular border areas of Armagh and Tyrone. Although the most recent statistics I saw, I think, allude to a reduction in rural crime in most of Northern Ireland, clearly these are operational issues for the police at one level, but there are also issues which require joined up work in partnership to fight those who would engage in this kind of crime, rather than merely to deal with crime when it happens. And that's good work being done in many cases by PCSPs and others as they look to different ways of addressing rural crime. Ms Dobson for a supplementary. Thank you. No, I didn't. And as a rural constituency MLA, I'm interested to hear your own opinion. And it's widely known that local intelligence can lead to criminals being caught. So what's the Minister's message to farm families who often feel let down by the follow-up service after a theft on their farms? And what more does he feel needs to be done to improve outcomes for those victims of rural crime? Well, of course, the, the justice system has ways of supporting those who have been victims of crime, whether they are urban or rural, whether it is specifically agricultural or not. Uh, clearly, there are issues of particular concern which tend to bubble up in one area or another at different times. Uh, but the key issue for me is not simply a matter of saying what is being done for the victims after the crime, but saying what is being done to fight the crime. And that's why I think the sort of activities we've seen with a number of rural PCSPs having promoted uh, uh, the agenda on matters like farm watch or running trailer marking schemes or the, uh, the subsidy that we were able to give to people who were putting tracker machines on heavy machinery such as tractors. All of those are ways in which the fight against rural crime has been supported and they will continue to be supported but a lot of it depends upon local initiative, local partnership working which the department can support but cannot initiate. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, last week I had uh, the privilege of uh, visiting the uh, McGabry Prison with other members of the Justice Committee. Uh, there we met the new Governor and the new management team in the prison, uh, and I have to uh, express my uh, support for the work that they are doing. But one of the areas that we raised in discussion with them was the high level of sickness among staff in the prison. Uh, are you satisfied that the, the new Governor and the new management team are working to uh, deal with this issue? Well, again, I thank Mr Dixon for that question. I'm glad that a, a number, although perhaps fewer than might have been, of the Justice Committee were able to do that visit last week, because I think it was important that they had the opportunity to see McGabry and to speak directly to staff there, whether at management or operational level. Um, Mr Dixon highlights specifically the issue of sickness, and there is no doubt that there was a particular issue where, if we look at the sickness rates across the civil service 
the Department of Justice scores badly, largely because of high sickness rates in the prison service, which, while they are understandable to a certain level, in that if you are a prison officer working on a landing, you may well not be fit to go to work, when if you were somebody with a basically desk job, you might be fit. Uh, but there were issues which required to be addressed and which I believe are being addressed. My information is that uh, in the couple of months since the beginning of August, there has been a 35 per cent reduction in sickness absence levels at McGabry, which is, I think, a good indication of the work which is being done by uh, Phil Ragg as Governor and his senior team within McGabry. Mr Dixon, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Principal Libby Speaker. Uh, indeed, Minister, and uh, Mr Ragg indicated that to us. Uh, and I, can I commend him and the new senior management team in, in that reduction? Will the Minister acknowledge with me, however, that being a, a, a prison officer or working in the prison service is a difficult and demanding job, and one for which this community uh, should give uh, a great deal of consideration to, even though the issue of sickness does need to be tackled? Well, yes, I think that, that point is well made. Um, I have the, had the opportunity on two or three occasions recently um, to meet staff working in some of the more difficult areas with, uh, with some of the Cat A and separated prisoners in McGabry, and I have done my best as Minister to convey my support for work they do in protecting this community in quite difficult circumstances inside the prison. It is clearly one of the more difficult areas which people have to work, frankly, anywhere in the public service in Northern Ireland. But I would certainly uh, join Mr Dixon in making those positive comments about that work and trust that other members, while they may have concerns about the way prisons operate, will also recognise the extremely good work being done by many of our officers under quite difficult conditions. Call Mr Pat Sheehan. Uh, does the Minister support his counterpart, uh, Frances Fitzgerald, in the South when she said that Ireland would welcome 4,000 refugees and would put all necessary support uh, in place to help those refugees integrate and also provide them with help to overcome the trauma they have experienced uh, in fleeing their own homelands? Principal Deputy Speaker, I am honestly not sure what the Minister of Justice can say in response to that question, which did not quite touch on any justice responsibilities. Um, but if Mr Sheehan wants me to apologise that I was not here last week because I was in Stormont House when the debate on welcoming refugees was put forward by my party colleagues, I am happy to say I was fully in line with what my party colleagues said that day. Mr Sheehan for a supplementary. <laughs> He's just lost me in that response. <laughs> but I'm just wondering uh, if the Minister would agree that we could take an equivalent number of refugees here in the South and that we could also put in place the necessary support to help those refugees integrate and, and provide support for them uh, to help overcome any trauma that they experienced in fleeing their homeland. I am sure, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr Sheehan would want the Minister of Justice to refer to good activity which the Minister sees being done, integrating members of a diverse uh, community in different ways into the way in which our system of government operates. Whether I have the power to officially set a number as Minister of Justice for those we should be admitting from Syria or Eritrea or wherever, I am not sure, but I think he makes a very valid point that people from this island have left and gone to many other parts of the world when we had difficulties here. And I think it's only but reasonable that we should recognise that we now have the ability to help people going through utterly traumatic circumstances in the Middle East and elsewhere. Call Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister, as one of those Ministers who is um, continuing to actually do his, do his duties um, and not play games, does he agree with the comments um, made uh, by the uh, CBI's Northern Ireland chairperson last week when he said that their members want a restructured, properly functioning executive with new mechanisms and procedures that deliver results and bring an end to the recent never-ending series of standoff logjams and showdowns? I am certainly happy to agree with my colleague on that one. I was not aware that the current chair of the CBI was actually a spokesperson for the Alliance Party, but it did seem that what he said was entirely sound in terms of the impetus on all of us to see that the Stormont House Agreement delivers. Um, standing here is the only minister who is here because he had the confidence of the, uh, the Assembly to be elected Justice Minister. I do think there are, there are significant positives in looking at slightly different ways of doing things which provoke a more joined-up way of providing government for the people of Northern Ireland. And I think 
we would all do well listening to the voices, not just of the chair of the CBI, but of the church leaders last week, um, and by uh, a number of community and voluntary sector groups reflected through the chair of the Community Relations Council on radio this morning. Ms. Cochran for a supplementary. <laughs> um, I don't really have much more to say, actually, at that point. <laughs> Call Mr. Michael McGimsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank Mrs. Cochran as well? Can I ask the Minister uh, where he sees his role uh, in terms of the increasing uh, heroin drug trade that is currently uh, evident in South Belfast by the increasing number of needle finds in public spaces and open spaces? Well, Mr. McGimsey certainly highlights a serious problem, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I think the role of the Minister of Justice is to do the best he can to uh, supply the resources to the justice agencies which are concerned with fighting that criminal activity, at the same time as other ministers, most notably the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety, a, a post about which Mr Majimsi has considerable experience, are doing their best to educate people and to assist those who wish to move away from heroin addiction. That concludes the question time. I invite the House to take its seats while we change the top table.